Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. My great uncle, who was my grandmother's brother, Abner George Fields, left Macon, Georgia, or nearby Macon, in 1929 uh, and moved to San Francisco, partly because he was very troubled by the provincialism of the South, and he was interested in Buddhism and metaphysics. So he ended up uh, opening Fields Bookstore on Polk Street in San Francisco. Uh, it's still there. And so uh, that's uh, actually become almost a landmark. And on the original uh, books marks that they used to give people, it had the Wheel of Fortune, which is one of my favorite motifs from Boethius, uh, that I also found in the Quran uh, almost identical to Boethius' vision of the Wheel of Fortune. But amongst the things, he had metaphysics, Buddhism, and then he had Sufism, because at that time, Islam wasn't really on the radar. But those of us who know, know that Sufism is, obviously it's a contested term, and we won't go into that, but Su Sufism was always considered part of the Islamic tradition. It was never seen as extraneous to it, although there are extraneous forms of Sufism to the Islamic tradition, in the same way that there are forms of theology that are also unacceptable by the majority of Muslims, and there's forms of even jurisprudence. So these are always going to be differences of opinion. But anyway, uh, I, I really want to uh, thank a few people uh, for doing this, but they're not in here yet. Imam Zaid. The, um, our tradition is a tradition of books. It began with a book. In fact, there's an argument that all civilizations begin with a book. There is no Plato or Socrates or Aristotle without Homer, that the foundation of Greek civilization really is the Iliad and the Odyssey. The foundation of the, the foundation of Western civilization is the Bible, undeniably. There is no Western civilization without the Bible. And certainly the foundation of Chinese civilization is the Analects of Confucius. These are the great books of the great civilizations of the world. And every civilization, a book that you'll find in the bookstore is Cormac McCarthy's book, Cormac McCarthy wrote a screenplay, and in that screenplay, one of the things that he has one of his characters speaking with uh, a Jewish man, and, he, and the Jewish man talks about his alienation in, in Europe of seeing Judaism and in, a, in a perverted form. This is his view of Christianity. But what's very fascinating to me is that in, in that dialogue, he said every civilization has an ideal human being. And the ideal human being in the Greek civilization was the warrior. Hence, Achilles, Odysseus, all these great Ajax, Hector. These are the great ideal of... And, and he says the, the ideal in Christianity and Judaism was the penitent, the, the ta'ib which got me thinking, what was the ideal in the Islamic civilization? And I think that the, the ideal in the Islamic civilization was the adib. It, it, was, it was a human being who had transformed his bestial nature into an angelic nature through the illumination of the intellect, through study, and through the acquisition of knowledge. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that seeking knowledge, tarab al ilm, was faridatun ala kulli muslimin wa muslima. And, and the ulama added muslima just to make sure that nobody misunderstood that. That's called idraj in the science of hadith. On every man and, and, and woman. Today, the United Nations estimates that about 30% of people on this planet are illiterate. But I would argue that it's probably closer to about 99%. 
I think that there's a real misconception about what true literacy is. I personally, and, I, and I'm not claiming literacy, but I know that I, I did not feel like I could really read books until I was in my late 40s. And I'm not making that up. My father, who was, and my brother's here as testimony, my father read more than anybody I've ever met. Uh, and we had a library in our house with hundreds of books because my father loved books. And, but he read constantly. My father told me at the age of about 86, my education's done. He said, I, I really feel like I'm done. In other words, and, and at, at the time I was thinking about our tradition, that seeking knowledge from the cradle to the grave, but I understood what he meant. It took me a while to get that. I understood what he meant. He was really talking about basic education. Just learning what you should know <laughs> before you can really start to study. And, and even into his 80s, he had his Latin cards that he carried around and he would review his Latin words because he read the Bible in Latin. He preferred it in, in Latin. But he studied his whole life. And what we're trying to do here really is revive literacy in our civilization. Not the American civilization per se, but in the Muslim civilization. We were one of the, the greatest human civilizations uh, ever. Most people from all over the world went to study with Muslims. They went to learn from Muslims. Roger Bacon learned Arabic because he wanted to study the cutting edge knowledge of his time. Averroes was read by Albertus Magnus and, and without Averroes, the Aristotelian tradition would have never re-entered Europe, Ibn Rushd. And St. Thomas Aquinas is the student of Albertus Magnus. So that's the Senate. Even though Aquinas refuted many of the things that Ibn Rushd argued, nonetheless, Ibn Rushd was a great door. In our tradition, knowledge is not in books. It's actually in the, in the breasts of human beings. We say, al-ilmu fi sudur And the Quran says, it's in the breasts of those who have been given knowledge. But our scholars at a certain point said, That knowledge went at a certain point from the breasts to the lines of books. But humans still remain keys to those books. And this is another thing studying with people that really know the text, those books that are worth studying. There's books that are not worth studying, but those books that are worth studying are best studied with people who really know those books. And one of my teachers said that you have to read and you have to discuss. And that reading alone is like eating alone. It's, it's, it's far less pleasurable than when you read with others. And, and, the, and we have a beautiful hadith in the Sahih that said, That no group of people gathers in a, in a place of devotion and reads the book of Allah and studies it with one another. In other words, they discuss the meanings. And, and the Prophet said, except the angels descend upon them, and this sakina, the shakina in the Jewish tradition, the sakina comes down, this, this, this tranquility enters the heart. And, and the rahma, the mercy of God, the grace of God pervades the gathering. And, and this is the civilizational project of really um, learning Acquiring that knowledge, applying that knowledge, and then transforming the world with that knowledge. We have a beautiful chapter in Al-Bukhari, in the Sahih of Al-Bukhari. It's called, Bab al-ilmi qabl al-qawli wal-amal. The chapter of knowledge before speaking and before activism, before action. And we have many people that act before they actually know how to act properly because prudence demands that you act properly 
Freedom is not a virtue. Freedom is a human good. But freedom is what enables virtue to be practiced. But when you don't have people that study and transform themselves through learning, then freedom becomes licentiousness. And it actually becomes a vice uh, of activity or an activity of vice. And so uh, that's, that's one of the things, just a few little uh, brief things. We had in our church, there was one of the great Persians. He was a minister who loved to read. Uh, Wazir uh, Muhammad Ismail. And he actually had uh, 17,000 books that he had to travel with. And so he had a caravan always, and they trained the camels to actually march in alphabetical order so he would know <laughs> where his books were <laughs> when he wanted to get to them. So there are many uh, interesting stories about that in our tradition of just the absolute love of books. Um, I was saying how when we were coming into Berkeley, Berkeley, what, what, I have a book called Bohemian Berkeley um, that talks about Berkeley 100 years ago. Berkeley was a Bohemian place 100 years ago. Uh, people were doing very weird stuff in Berkeley. And so places have personalities. It's just a fact of life. If you go to a city, it, it's got a personality. Mecca has a personality. The people living there have a personality. They always have. They've always talked about the Meccans the same way throughout the history of Islam. Medina has a personality. And the people have always had it. And the same type of people you'll find. But Berkeley has a personality. It's very quirky. It's very weird. Um, but it's also fascinating and um, so when, when we were coming in, I was just talking about that, that th this place has such an interesting uh, quality. And one of the qualities is that so many extraordinary things began here uh, for good and for evil. I mean, there's some terrible things that have happened at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, the neutron bomb was invented there. Uh, but also some truly great things uh, have, have happened here uh, the free speech movement was an extraordinary event in my own lifetime. So um, we, we have a love of books in our tradition, and we want to encourage that. And so this is a very humble beginning, but we're hoping that it will increase. Um, we know now that our Library of Congress has uh, an incredible number of, 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 of books. We're talking now in the millions. We, but we know that the Muslims, at one point in Damascus, there were over three million manuscripts. Uh, many of our great libraries were burnt to the ground. Uh, the, the Crusaders burnt one of the greatest libraries in, in, in history uh, in, in, in Damascus. Uh, in Andalusia, they had huge celebratory events where they burnt uh, the great works of the Andalusian Muslims. The Nazis burnt books. and so. One of the things that always tyrants do is they censor books. This is something that tyrants will always do. They will prevent books from being read because books are the bombs of the mind. We talk about he blew my mind or it blew my mind. That books can literally obliterate uh, worldviews. They can change the way you think and the way you perceive the world for good and for evil. And that's why it's so important to be trained critically before you really read books. And this is traditionally what we call the sina'at with thadat, what in the West they call the trivium of learning how to read critically through grammar, through dialectic and uh, logic, and through rhetoric, and through understanding these things. So we really, um, it's, it's a great, uh, uh, just, I think, um, event for us today, but I want to thank two people. There are many people involved, and I don't, uh, I, if I began to do that, I wouldn't get through, but I want to thank two people in particular. The first person I want to thank is Catherine Hamze, because I wanted a bookstore for a very long time, and we talked about this, and I just mentioned it in passing about, you know, I've been trying to get a bookstore in this place, Catherine just took that and ran with it. We call her, we don't call her Catherine the Great because that's already been trademarked, 
but Imam Zaid said we call her Catherine El Kubra. So, uh, but she really just ran with it, and that's why it's there today. But the second person, and what my condition always, and with the other co-founders, uh, Dr. Hatim and Imam Zaid, Shakir, may Allah preserve them, elevate them, um, is is the ihsan that has to go with what we do because our community, again, was a community that was devoted to beauty and devoted to uh, ihsan, to making things beautiful. And so we were very fortunate to have in the area uh, our dear sister Khadija O'Connell and from the great uh, blood clan of the O'Connells, married to an O'Connell, the, 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 the five blood clans, one of them was the O'Connells. And Daniel O'Connell, the great Irish orator, wrote beautiful letters to the Irish community uh, in America in the 1820s and 30s, uh, encouraging them to ally with the African-American people here uh, because they felt that the enemy of bigotry was the same. It was the Anglo-Saxons. But unfortunately, that never happened. There's an interesting book, if you're, if you're uh, intrigued by that, called How the Irish Became White, which was uh, when the Anglo-Saxons decided to make the Irish white so that they wouldn't ally with the African-American community and create a lot of dissension between these two communities. But I was very happy to see, as somebody who has a lot of Irish blood, I was very happy to see that uh, an academic in uh, George, uh, in Washington, D.C., at one of the major universities there, did a study based on the aims and imports of the Sharia of Islam to see which country in the world was most Sharia compliant. And he determined that it was Ireland. <laughs> so uh, we have our beloved Irish American sister, Khadija O'Connell. So I want to, uh, on behalf of uh, all three of us, in fact, you guys, why don't you come up, uh, Imam Zaid and Dr. Hatim. Uh, we want to give just a token of appreciation to Khadija Annette O'Connell for all the work that she did making the um, the bookstore so beautiful. So is Khadija here? Is she here? Uh, she doesn't want to come up. Come, come on up, Khadija. Khadija's like Susan Cain wrote a uh, Su Susan Cain wrote a beautiful book called Quiet about introverted people and how important they are in the world. So uh, yeah, so thank you, Khadija. Yeah, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah bi ni'matihi tatamma salihat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Alhamdulillah. Uh, books, that's what it's all about. Seriously, may Allah uh, bless us to remain a community of readers. The first command that Allah gives in the Quran is Iqra. He didn't say shahid. He said read. He didn't say view. There's a there's a, a book out now. Speaking of books, called Glow Kids: The Effect of Constantly Looking at Screens on the Development of the Human Brain in Children. And uh, so we, we're, we're readers, and we're supposed to read books. Our scripture is called the book, Al-Kitab. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ And so may Allah bless us to remain a, a community of readers who love to read, who love books. We were mentioning earlier that uh, the Haitian Revolution, even before Toussaint, and the violent revolution that the real architects of the Haitian revolution were Muslims because one of the early planners was known as Bookman. And the Muslims amongst the slaves were the people of literacy and the people were associated with books. So the fact that this individual was referred to as Bookman leads the historians to believe that he was a Muslim. And, and that the, the ceremony, there's some, you can, Dr. Duyuf goes into this in Servants of Allah, that 
they say it was some a voodoo ceremony was actually a Sufi Hadara. <laughs> And just, but to conclude, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, do your voodoo and avoid the voodoo. But there, there are brothers in here who are incarcerated. And this goes back to, to Sheikh Hamza's point about the adib, how, how books made people human, humanized people that this country dehumanized in the worst of ways, in the absolute worst of ways, made into killers, into heartless killers, into thieves and scoundrels of, of the worst description. When in, and, and one of the reasons, and I've, I've talked to experts to confirm this, but I've always believed one of the reasons so many of our young people go off the rails is because we failed them. And one way that we failed them is that they're part of those illiterate masses that Sheikh Hamza was talking about. And because they're illiterate and they're designated for special education and they're ridiculed in first and second grade, third, fourth, fifth grade, they drop out, they drift into the streets and they never learn to read. And they don't have any self-esteem. And they don't have any respect for themselves. So how can they respect others? And they end up in a life of, of, of crime. And then they go into these prisons. And then they discover the book. And, and for many of them, the first book they read from cover to cover is the Quran. In their life. I, I talk to some people, Muslims, who, who've been incarcerated and became Muslim in prison. And they study the book. Sheikh Hamza mentioned, Yatadarasuna, Yatadarasunahu, Bainahum. And they discuss the Quran and they humanize themselves and they become Udaba. They become Adibs. They become truly human. And they come out of those prisons and they're, they're some of them the most gentle, respectful people. They went in, they, were, they weren't even, they were subhuman. And they came out. They were human, and they were rich people, rich in character, and they were people who loved reading and talk about books. And it's, it's, it started with the book, El Kitab. So to lighten things up a bit by quoting our former president, never misunderestimate the power of books. Salaam alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I don't know if Dr. Uh, if Dr. Abdullah Ali is here today, because I was expecting him to be here with us, because I wanted to introduce him as Dr. Abdullah Ali, because he just finished his PhD just yesterday. Uh, and part of the PhD work is that you have to go through the work of others. And navigate their writings as you write your thesis and then to try to see where some of those ideas fit to expand the knowledge and become specialized in one area. And he has done a really a masterful uh, piece of work dealing with the issue of race in early Islamic uh, literature. And we have considerable references to race, but the challenge is again, is as we read classical text, it's very important to take out our contemporary lens that through which we read the classical text. Because immediately when you read race, you're immediately looking at the race construct post-1492, and you imagine plantation in America, you imagine race as a configuration of skin tone that is attached to economic modes of production, rather than thinking in cultural tribal terms in the pre-modern period. So how to navigate this at a very critical period of time in here where we have increasing consciousness about the centrality of race and racism in our own society, both to de 
racialize our own thinking as Muslims because I still believe that we have internalized racism and we all are attempting to achieve a sense of being with the superior. And when you want to achieve and be with the superior, you end up hating yourself and those who are like you. And we have a whole discourse that shows that violence among same racial group tends to be higher than violence toward the superior group. Because what happens for the inferior group, you get a sense of self-hate. And I say that the modern period, if anything, has made self-hate the primary commodity that is transformed in our modes of media and intellectual production, that it becomes vested in our own subconsciousness, let alone our consciousness in looking at the other. So I think his work is important. I think it's going to be published, and it's going to be cited extensively, which gets us into uh, really it's, when you take on an intellectual project, that Zaytuna is an intellectual project. It's rooted in the Quran, in the book, but it's also the civilization that emerges out of it. I think Imam Zaid talks about uh, Bukuman in Haiti. Now, he actually started the revolution with a speech that made a distinction between what he called the God of the whites versus the God of the slaves. And in that, we could see that he made a distinction and a conscious distinction on what he believed to be the social, political, economic, religious institution that governed the plantation and the race structure versus what he believed the slaves who had a different consciousness and different understanding of God and the references in there, Sylviana Duyouf writes about it, Alan Austin writes about it, Gomez writes about it. So there's enough literature to show that the Haitian revolution was founded upon Islamic consciousness and the first political document that was written in the New World in relations to political consciousness was actually written with an Islamic foundation to it, if not itself being an Arabic Islamic text uh, in general. So in here we get into the centrality of literacy. Uh, in the United States, the last remaining text written in the handwriting of slaves in their own indigenous languages from Africa is Arabic either is a Quranic text or is a Maliki text. That's what you have in relations to the Arabic language. Then the first text that you read in slave narrative is the narrative of Job bin Solomon. And if you study African-American literature, Job bin Solomon is recognized in the literature of African-American as the founding father of African-American literature. And, uh, uh, Henry Gaze Jr. from Harvard, in his collection of slave narrative, the first narrative you read is Job bin Solomon, Ayub bin Sulaiman, who actually was freed, made it to England. He learned Arabic, he learned actually English on his journey to Africa, a uh, journey of three and a half months. When he arrived into England, he already began to debate with the Spalding uh, Gentleman Club, the same club that have Isaac Newton. And in he arrives in uh, 1833, and the next year, 1834, the, translation, the first translation of the Quran actually is published, and all indication that he held in that initial uh, translation of the Quran. So what we have is magnanimous individuals in our history, and I'm not even touching on uh, Grenada and uh, Cordoba. This summer we took students to Grenada and Cordoba. We took them actually to the street where they burned the books. And literally the street where books were burned in, Granada, in Cordoba and also the street where they burned the books in Granada. And the both streets are called the streets where the books were burned. And it's an out in an alley. And just to show the distinction between the Islamic civilization, which I believe at the foundation of it, that we are the custodians of human knowledge. That's our mission. That's why Iqra, it did not say only to read the Quran. We read the Quran, but we are the custodians on not only the factual and the correct foundation of, of human intellect, but also where they went in order to actually discuss and be able to guide to people to that which is correct by being a custodian. You cannot be a custodian if it's only you think about yourself. You have to think broadly uh, in, in terms of the human contribution. In our class, Contemporary Islamic Thought, we begin our class with reading actually when Asia was the world. And I recommend we have it in the bookstore. Read it because it actually traces the history of the arrival of Islam, but looks, looks at 
the history of Asia from prior to Islam, traces Hinduism, Buddhism, traces Islam, and also arrives at with the arrival of the Europeans in Asia. It's an important book that gives you a broader understanding of what it is to be a person committed to an intellectual project, what is it to be a community and a, an individual that is committed to scholarship, and what type of work that is ahead of us, because we believe, at least from myself and Imam Zaid and Sheikh Hamza, that we want to establish this as the academic address for America in a broader sense and to elevate our community and our scholarship to the highest level. So when you speak about Islam in America, you know exactly where the address is in here and across the board in terms of the intellectual contribution of the past as well as in the present. So the bookstore is one step. Right in the long journey that we started, and hopefully the rest of the community will continue in the future. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. So, just again, I want to thank you all. Uh, I'll end with a quote from Voltaire. Um, he said that books dissipate ignorance. Then he said a very interesting, uh, modifying uh, phrase that follows. He said the guardian and safeguard of every police state. In other words, ignorance is what creates police states. That educated people, truly educated people, are self-governing. And, and this is what Medina was. It was a self-governing state. Our Prophet ﷺ didn't need to have a police force because those people had internalized morality. And so uh, they could walk freely uh, in, in, and, and that's because of Iqra, of that transformation that happened. So uh, thank you for celebrating with us this event. Uh, we hope, inshallah, that you continue to share with us as we progress forward, inshallah. And I also just congratulate Dr. Ali Atai also, who just got his PhD. So we had two upgrades in our faculty, upgrades just in terms of those outward things that are very important in this culture. Uh, Allah yubarak fikum, inshallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase all of you. May he inshallah open our hearts to true knowledge and, and gift us with the wisdom that comes from it and then the ability to act according to it. The Prophet sallallahu said, uh, Oh Allah, arina il haqqa haqqa, show me truth as truth because you can see truth as falsehood. You can also see falsehood as truth. So he said, show me truth as truth and, and provide me with the ability to follow it. Because you can see the truth, but then you don't follow it. And then he said, and show me falsehood as falsehood. And, and give me the ability to avoid it. So may we be people that follow the truth and avoid the falsehood. Jazakumullah khairan wa salamu alaykum.